Hello and welcome back to the Nasty Metal Production Channel here at YouTube and welcome to another Album of the Week. This is episode number 190 and today I will be discussing Pyromania, the third album from still current mega rock stars Def Leopard. Actually, I probably shouldn't have called them rock stars. I guess just call them pop stars. I know this is probably going to ruffle some feathers. Actually, I think this episode's going to ruffle some feathers. Probably the first, actually the first in a long time since I've ruffled up the uh, the feathers of the Def Leppard fanboy fan base. Uh, I don't have to bring up uh, the first time that I ever ruffled up the feathers of the Def Leppard fanboy fan base. That was definitely several years ago but I am taking it this is probably going to be the first in a long time so get ready folks we're going to be going on a very bumpy ride here now since the album has reached its 40th anniversary again released on January 20th of 1983 through both Vertigo Records and Mercury Records I think Vertigo in Europe and Mercury here in the United States in 1983. And normally when I be doing these anniversary based episodes, I tend to try and celebrate these albums. However, in the case for Pyromania, I will not be celebrating Pyromania. But I will also not... Be, I guess to put it very, very bluntly, shitting on the record. No, I will not be. But instead, what I'm just going to be doing is discuss on why Pyromania is, was seen and is still seen as a polarizing record. Especially when it came to what was the early... Fan base, you know, for Def Leppard and what would soon become the brand new fan base for Def Leppard and the fan base that still continues on supporting Def Leppard to this very day, even though they tend to, I think, f make records that are so far removed, even what they were doing, especially with Pyromania here. Again, all the that's why I didn't even buy the was it Diamond Star Halos because of it, it, musically. It just did nothing for me, and again, it, it's mostly from what I heard, you know, and it just was like, you know, what? I'm, I'm not going to waste any more money on these guys, and I certainly don't even care if I even go to any of those freaking stadium shows, whatever, because I'm, I'm not going to put that much money back into to this band. I just don't want to, because again, musically, it just does nothing for me, and, and at this point, I'm fine with not support or but or buying any more new albums from this band and so I pretty much I'm just comfortable with sticking with what they did and pretty much everything up to this album here you know power mania I am fine with that and so that's what I'm going to be discussing here is what this album did to basically not just again its fan base but also even to even the music scene in general, the whole music industry and hard rock and even as well heavy metal. This album really is the album that I think and did just as much change in, in what people were still perceiving as big metal records at this time. This is the album I think that really kind of it transitioned everything from what was kind of there before to what you're going to end up getting afterwards. This album pretty much marked one of the biggest changes. And the thing is, 
this wasn't even the only record to be released in 1983 that would definitely do some changes to the overall sound and and the 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 musical structuring and production just everything eliminator from zz top again pyromania and eliminator are probably the two of the biggest rock albums to be released in 1983 that changed the entire landscape for just rock music and the way we even uh, look at even production and the way bands I think looked at as way especially from a very expensive standpoint as well so these these are again the two monumental records that changed everything and that's what I'm just going to be discussing with Pyromania here so I'm just going to get straight into it now prior to the release of Pyromania and pretty much during the recording of this album which the recording process for Pyromania at least took about 11 months 11 fucking months for this album because the recording process for Pyromania began in January of 1982 and then concluded in November of 1982 and many of the many reasons that prolonged this the recording for the album also has to do with the fact that original guitar player Pete Willis ended up being fired mids in recording this album. The only thing he ever really finished for Power Mania was just the rhythm guitar tracks. He didn't get to record a lot of the guitar solos that ended up being uh, finished by what would become the brand new member for Def Leppard and who is still with this band to this very day, that being Phil Collin, who of course uh, was just coming off the heels of being in his previous band, Girl, with vocalist Phil Lewis, who then eventually would uh, re-show up in the United States with Tracy Guns and LA Guns. So that's how that story for Girl went. But Phil Collin was, I think, the, the first one of Girl to really kind of make it post-Girl. So... He ended up coming in, he finished all the guitar solos, and this ended up being what finished off the album. And, and of course, uh, Robert Mutt Lang is still on the producer's chair for this album. Again, to kind of re recap the Robert Mutt Lang's time at Def Leppard, it began in 1981 with High and Dry, and right when he was beginning to produce Def Leppard he was still in the middle of working with ACDC on what would be their second record with Brian Johnson that being for those about to rock and that album too also took uh, several months though not as much as the months that it took to record Power Mania here and again if the members of ACDC were feeling, let's say, very jet-lagged and very monotonous and just tired with Robert Mutt Lang, then I think this, I think, was almost, this is overkill when it came to this album right here. And what's funny is, and I, I do want to bring this up as well before I really go any further, is that I've... When it comes to people discussing, you know, the best sounding ACDC records, whatever, everyone always goes back to Back in Black. And they all said, well, ACDC sucked when, when they ditched Robert Mutt Lang. They should have never ditched him. You know, I didn't really bring this up for too much as well. I didn't really when I covered For Those About to Rock. But I think many people tend to overlook one of the many reasons why Back in Black sounded so good and it wasn't because of Robert Mutt Lang I think it also I mean he's probably one, uh, one of the very many reasons why Back in Black sounded so good but the thing is people I think tend to overlook the engineer and even at times I think even the mixer as well Tony Platt who I think was much just as much responsible in uh, how Back in Black sounded. You know, he's, I think, was a re many reasons that even glued that record together. It was, again, he was responsible for a lot of the human elements in 
back in black. Yes, folks, I did use human elements because that's going to make a play in my overall analysis of Pyromania. So I just think it's very, very, very ridiculous. And I think many people tend to put a lot of the, the, the credit to Robert Mutt Lang. And because look at for those about to rock, look how that, that uh, turned out. And that wasn't just because of the songs themselves. It's also because of production. Way too overproduced to begin with. Much more overproduced to con- compared to Back in Black. And, and everyone just goes on, oh, they, they were better with Robert Mutt Lang. And yet, many people tend to only cite one record. Because they still all go, well, for those sucked. And yet, that was produced by Robert Mutt Lang. So, I think it's a very biased opinion when it comes to... Robert Mutt Lang. However, when it comes down to, let's say, the other artists that Robert Mutt Lang at least had worked with, I mean, Foreigner with the Foreigner 4 record, and of course, here with Def Leppard. So, I just don't get why many people think that ACDC would have been better off if they kept Robert, knowing that, look what happened here with Def Leppard. And this is where I'm going to, why... I'm going to be just discussing about this because to me, this still has a very good part to play in my analysis of Pyromania as a whole is a lot of the reasons for the stuff he did with ACDC and a lot of the stuff that led to him basically uh, kicked off the producer's chair from, you know, from working with ACDC, why they, they didn't want to work with him anymore. And it's because of his methods to producing a record. I mean, hey, they kept Tony Platt for Flick of the Switch because he didn't participate in the recording of For Those About to Rock. So they obviously knew that uh, who they wanted to keep from their time working with Robert Mutt Lang. So, but I guess because of the, the difference why I think Robert Mutt Lang was kicked from, from being with ACDC or working with them and compared to Def Leppard continuing with Robert Mutt Lang is because of Robert couldn't, I don't think, could not convince his way, his style, you know, to ACDC. Because of for, for as long as they had been up to that, you know, during that point here, in like 81, 82 on for, for again, their, their years that they've been re- recording and their albums and the way they do it, the way they structure it, it's more simple and it's more streamlined compared to Robert Mutt Lang. Rob, Robert just has, a, he again, the mindset is just different. And to me, I've uh, pretty much come to really realize that it was never, I don't think was ever the the best match because Robert just has a much different way of looking at how to produce a record. And yet it's not my favorite way of producing a record. I don't like his style of how he produces a record. I don't like the, 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 the time and the indulgence that he tends to take into producing a record. It's, it's, to the point of just straight up overkill. And I think you have more ways of fucking with, uh, with, with a band's time than you probably do on actually, let's say, prospering a band. You know, I think his methods, I think, kind of kills the, a, a momentum for any band. And it's just because of his methods to it than, let's just say, the way he just makes a record sound, which I also don't really care for, given what I'm going to be getting into for Pyromania. So without further ado, let me just get straight into for Pyromania, okay? Now, I've spent many years listening to this record. I mean, this was this was actually was once given to me as a birthday gift from my cousin Sean. Several, many, like, what, decades ago. And the thing I even remember, remember this day, whatever, is that I was given Pyromania and my brother was given Kill Em All from Metallica. So it's just kind of funny how that dynamic worked out. And yet again, I listen, I listen to Pyromania a lot. And I've, again, I cut my teeth on this record for you for like years and decades. And I can't really disregard 
my original love for this album and I still have a fondness for this album, okay? I got a big fondness for it, especially for some of the songs on this album. However, coming back, especially most recently, for, you know, to try and come up with material, you know, to, to say for this Album of the Week episode, I gave it a re-listen and... Man, I don't know. Maybe it's because of I'm just right now currently in a more heavier uh, mindset right now. Meaning I, I'm kind of in the mood for more heavier records. Definitely more like the thrash metal and death metal um, you know, variety. But something about the sound finally did not click with me the way that it used to click with me. And again, it could be what what's right now what I'm currently in the mood for. But then I then think about the last couple of times I've listened to Pyromania. And I have noticed that over time, this album has actually lost more and more of its muster to me than the previous couple of albums that came, you know, before Pyromania. Even the ones... Let's say they're recorded as demos, or whatever, you know, the old, the early stuff. Those still, at least, they tend to hold up better, especially like On Through the Night and High and Dry. For some reason, those albums still hold up to me. But Pyromania, somehow, it's just starting to sound dated. This, and again, it all comes back to Robert Mutt Lang and what he seemed to have sold the fucking guys of Def Leppard since they were still fairly young and they weren't nearly as experienced as, again, compared to ACDC, who had already were becoming very experienced. And not just as a live band, but even as a recording band. And so they already had a, a general idea of how they do their albums compared to the stuff that Robert Mutt Lang does as a producer. And... I think that's where the, everything just went so sideways, I think, with Def Leppard. Because he it, it seemed like he took a lot of advantage because of the fact that they were so inexperienced still. And it just seemed like he, he could have his way in getting these guys you know, to be, be convinced to his ways of, of producing and recording than compared to the ways that, that a band like ACDC wanted their stuff to be produced in the way they, sh and the time they should take to record an album. And this is, again, this is in the mind frame of the early 80s. This is not the way things are now between these bands, but this is more to what things were when these bands were still in their prime in a way. You know, they were still at their height. And Def Leppard, I don't know, were about to hit their, their stride. You know, they're about to hit their height. And it is going to be with this record. It was beginning with High and Dry, but it's going to begin here with Power Mania. And this is where the divide really began. And I think it all also pretty much has to do with what Mutt Lang did. It's very similar to with Bob Ezrin and the guys of Kiss. Mostly Paul and Gene. They somehow... All the stuff they learned, whatever, for, or just saw from Bob Eslin, it was like they, the Ark of the Covenant, I think, was just opened up. It's like they, they, they just saw something. He opened up the Vatican, I think, to, to, to these guys. And they, they just saw what was different and what, they, what could be done. And they just took it as gospel. And they just went with this and just like, well, I guess this, this is how you really do things. And it just screwed up all their mindset. And I think this is what ended up happening, I think, with Pete Willis. A very similar way, I think, with Ace Freely, too, with uh, Kiss. I think it really took a toll on these guys, just the, the whole recording process. And the different method that was being taken with with these albums. And in the case for here, for like Pyromania, I think this took a toll on Pete Willis because of, again... He was starting to become a drunk during this, again, during the period of recording this album. And I think that could just be because of how long the recording process was taken. Because of, look what kind of guy Robert Mutt Lang is. 
he has to do it this way. If it doesn't sound this, if he doesn't think the drums sound this big or this massive, it's a no-go. Because that's what seemed what um, Robert Mart Lang was all fixated on was how big the drums are going to sound. Yeah, real fucking massive. And that's why ACDC cut him. Because it, just, it got too stupid. But Robert Mutt Lang could easily manipulate young people into obviously believing that his way is probably the best way because this is the way that's going to make you money. Which it did. This sound, of course, uh, made Def Leppard a lot of money, but it also hurt their core fan base of what they had originally. And I'm not just talking about the fan base they really started or created when they were a part of the so-called New Wave or British Heavy Metal movement, but what the fantasy even had because of what they liked or were hearing before. And this is the album that just killed it. But yet, they, they, they gained a new fan base out of it that gained them a much wider audience. Again, good for them. And it's glad, I'm glad that, that, that a band was able to do that, you know. But at the same time, you jaded what you had before, instead of trying to come up with a way that would keep your original fan base, but also at, at the, the same, make a newer fan base, you chose to just to just give a middle finger to your old fan base. They're like, well, we don't like you because we don't want to be a part of that, that movement. We didn't want to be a part of that movement. It was insulting to us. Therefore, it's like, we're, we're better than that. It, you already created your little own uh, a self-absorbed rich guy mentality that I, I just don't like that, that kind of mentality to begin with. And it's just like, well, this stuff is inferior because we're going to make a lot of money. That's just what way I think it ended up turning out for, for this. And that's kind of what really caused the riff. And musically, again, there's some songs on Pyromania that I like. And it's the stuff that, that still reminds me of the earlier stuff. Again, the stuff that you kind of heard uh, here and there on the first two albums. Uh, again, uh, the first song, the opening track, Rock Rock Till You Drop, which used to have been in their playlist before this album because it used to be under the name Medicine Man. And if you've got the, what was it, the, the early days, whatever box set that came out, I think a couple of years ago, that pretty much focused on their early period. Uh, then you pretty much already have the definitive version of Rock Rock Till You Drop. You already have it. Again, it says Me Medicine Man, and that's the best version of this song to begin with. Not this version, no. Uh, even though I, I do enjoy it, it just sat, it just sounds so inferior to what originally was at. And then the other songs I do like that's off this one, again, Stage Fright, which is definitely one, that, another hugely uh, likable song. It's a straight up hard rocker that wouldn't have been too out of place off of like high and dry. And that's uh, definitely what I like. And then of course, Die Hard the Hunter, another one. I could have easily been on probably their, their first two records actually to me personally. And it's a very cool song. However, I, you know, when re-listening to like Stage Fright and Die Hard the Hunter, I pretty much noticed how overproduced they made these songs i think they kind of st again this has been my my roadblock now in actually re-enjoying pyromania is that robert mutt lang made things way too slick added way too much in, in the mix again the keyboards or whatever and i think it, it took away i think what was already a pretty you know cool hard rock songs and at times sure they, they, they've got a bit of a slight metal feel to them but don't tell that to Def Leppard they don't want to be, be uh, associated with the term metal that that's just not them which okay I get that but then that's probably what, why they had to go down the, the the direction of the more popular rock sounds or whatever because of they just or forced themselves down to which again I guess they, they executed quite well and that's what what gain them big paychecks but for me personally for for what i want in a record and for what i personally enjoy that that stuff does nothing for me it does nothing for me and this is why i think to to an extent pyromania does something for me because of there's at least some of that early sound left over on this album 
and that's the stuff that I tend to really enjoy on the record. But at the same time, this, the production and everything just robs, I think, some of these songs of that. I mean, even another one like, like even like what, Coming Under Fire and Billy's Got a Gun. These two, again, two other songs I also really think are pretty cool, you know, very hard rockers. But yet, again, it's just set that, that production and even the drums. And Rick Allen's drum snare that was heard on High and Dry was, yes, you're, it was beginning to come sound very, very overproduced. Because, again, uh, it, what Robert Mutt Langwood w- was wanting at the time. And, again, it's not too far off to the the sort of type of drum snare you kind of were getting on, let's say, for those about to rock. However, there still was a human element to be heard within these drum snares. It still sounded human to an extent, but you can kind of can see where things are heading. And with the case of Pyromania, something about the drum snares always kind of sounded way too processed compared to the drum snares on High and Dry. They just sounded at least you took the already naturally recorded drum snares, but yet you kind of pitched them a bit, you know, and I've done this trick again, and let's say mixing my own music, whatever, and how to kind of make things pop more, and how to make them sound a lot more bigger and more massive, and that is by pitching the drums, especially lower pitching them, and then, of course, you on top of it, you layer it, you know, you layer something else to be on top of these drum snares. They can even more kind of pop out within the mix to make them sound much more bigger. Yet, in the case for the drum snares on Pyromania here, they sound more like almost electric drums. The type of drum snares that you're going to end up hearing on Hysteria. And from what I've heard about is that, the, that there's a truth to this. Supposedly, and I think it's been documented that Rick Allen, I think he kind of did, but he didn't. That most of the drum snares are actually synth drum snares. And so that's, again, a very similar technique that I think was being done too with uh, Eliminator by ZZ Top. They were doing the same thing, uh, the same method and using electric drum snares or synth drum snares or whatever instead of real natural drum snares and that's because I think it's a case with this album too with Pyromania I think Robert Mutt Lang was pretty much I think just in the same vicinity as like Bill Ham or whatever you know the guys that were at least were producing ZZ Top's uh, record so they all had the same mindset. They all were kind of seeing that there is a change in musical instruments, stuff that's more vastly high end, you know, especially for the technology. Everything's becoming a bit more high end now at this point. And I think they were looking at making a record that was going to sound very much the sounds of that year. And so making something that's going to be the state of the art. And that's pretty much what you were getting with. Pyromania, and that's what you're going to be getting with Eliminator from ZZ Top. These were state-of-the-art sounding records. These were basically the the production ideas, the recording ideas of that timeline, and because they were brand new. And so, again, the, uh, Robert Mutt Lang just wanted to take advantage of that. But again, what it did in the process was that it it kind of took away most of what was the what was still left i guess of the human elements and just taken apart and trying to make something that would be more appealing to the freaking music industry all the big wigs and it was like oh oh ooh, this is this is new and and hip i guess to kind of use the the term it, so all in all what what ended up being the result of this album is that what was still left of the old sound all of a sudden end up getting really updated to the point where now it just sounds super freaking dated because at least some of the early stuff at least some of the stuff is still sounds a little bit fresh to me because of they all have a very natural sound to them everything sounds so natural 
and just pyromania it just everything was just starting to sound it still in a way kind of sells you know it's still a very one of Def Leppard's most sold records along with like Hysteria but that's I guess is what the mindset is right now even to this day is that look at uh, for another example is a band like Ghost uh, the most recent album uh, what was it Joe Elliott he pretty much went and said this sounds like the modern day Hysteria because they're, they're now we we are back to one to get to making records that sound like they're recorded by synthetic machines. No longer do, do, do we care, I guess, about recording anything in, in, a hum, in a very human way. We don't care about listening to humans play instruments. We ca- I guess we just care about if we listen to synthetic AIs, I guess, write and record music because of... That's just what uh, what's selling right now, I guess, and and that and that's what's uh, going to appeal to even the idiots over at the freaking Grammys. It's like, well, if it's got this kind of sound, if it's it has this uh, the, the, this element, and I guess if the people are buying it, then this is uh, what's going to make us think about nominating and possibly uh, giving it the winner. You know, or we'll make it the winner. Either way, I do enjoy Pyromania, but this is just where everything ends for me here. You know, this is where the road ends for me with Def Leppard. And I've given most of some of their later stuff as much of a shot as possible, but they just do nothing for me. And I I just have no inspiration, you know, to listen to any of their their newest stuff. Again, the last Def Leppard album I ever purchased was their self-titled album from 2015 and... That's the review that I did, and I pissed off a lot of the the Def Leppard fanboys, you know, on the fangirls, whatever. It's just that I what I said, I guess, was so wrong, and because of I just have person, you know, different personal tastes and what I like, and I guess if I try and be honest about what I personally loved and what I liked about Def Leppard, I'm pretty much just uh, looked as as a a out of touch person, whatever. Even I'm fucking 27 years old right now, and I've got what I like. And the stuff that Def Leppard has been releasing just does nothing for me. It's not appealing to me. And so I'm I'm not gonna force myself to like something because somebody else uh, likes it. That's just not uh, not who I am. I have to like the music first before I even go on and say anything nice or anything good about it you know i have to actually really feel the the music itself and just nothing about some of that stuff uh, uh, i feel nothing at any of those stuff I, I, it, it it just feels so hollow to me and that's not what i not i want i don't want to listen to something that's hollow i don't want to have to lie about something that i just don't sincerely like and I'm not, not going to be shy about my comments. So that's just the whole moral, I think, of this uh, for, for me, especially when it comes to this band is I'm not going to force myself to like any of their other stuff because of because other people do. So I'm going to be honest about my opinions. I'm going to be honest about what I feel about Def Leppard and... I'm not going to shy away from from my comments and if it pisses some people off, it's going to piss people off. And I'm fine with that. And so this is pretty much where the road ends for me and Def Leppard and I'm just going to keep it that way. And so I've covered the two other Def Leppard albums on this channel, On Through the Night and High and Dry, and now I've in a way covered Pyromania and... From here on, I'm no longer going to be covering anything else from Def Leppard. So you're not going to see me cover Hysteria because of what am I really going to talk about. I'm just going to say how much I fucking hate that record and how much I think the production on it robbed whatever that was kind of left. And I think even Pour Some Sugar on Me is one of the most overrated, one of the most mundane pieces of shit I think that was ever released that ever got radio play and ever gave the band a paycheck and a giant ass paycheck too. So I, I, I'm not going to cover that album and I'm just going to show more and more disdain 
and that's about it. And you're not going to see me ever cover Adrenalize because that's just that's like already the bottom of the barrel when it, when it comes to Def Leppard. You're like you're scratching at the surface. Hell, you're scratching at the surface if you go all the way up to like songs from the Sparkle Lounge. That is really scratching the surface when it comes to Def Leppard. That is like the bottom of the barrel. Actually, you're basically are, are just scraping at the crust and the gunk that, that's on that bottom of the barrel. And it just sounds foul and disgusting. It's musky and it's just disgusting. And that that's just, ugh, that's just about it. And then the 2015 album is just that, eh, that, that that's on the side there. That's just side gunk. But it's not bottom gunk, where it's not you know bottom tier gunk, which just looks fucking nasty to begin with, and you're you're probably gonna worry that you're probably gonna get I don't know asbestos, ugh. But the stuff that but the 2015 album that, that that's the shit you see on the side of the barrel, and it's just eh, that's nothing. It's just it yeah it's a little crusty, but it doesn't have lead on it or something, and you're not gonna feel like you're gonna gonna get yourself poisoned, but. Still, it's not good to begin with. And then the new album, you're just going on the bottom. That that's like the 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 back of what was the bottom of the barrel. So it's like you turn it upside down and that's the top, you know, basically now is the top and that's just what that is. And it's just well, this it's it's nothing there, but it's it is. Somehow it, it's not too noticeable, but it's somehow you see a little speck there, like, oh okay, th- there it is. There's Diamond Star Halos. All right. Well, you're you're only tiny, but that's about it, and I'm not gonna worry worry about touching it, but it's there. So there it is. That's basically me summoning up the almost the discography of Def Leppard. The minute you get past Pyromania and probably get to like Hysteria, everything else afterwards, it's just useless, useless shit. So I pretty much uh, drowned on for this for as long as I was thinking of, but you know what, I I. I kind of unplanned this to begin with it, to an extent. I didn't want to type any of my thoughts down or anything. I just wanted to kind of do it and be more outspoken and more at least come from the heart when it came to this episode. And again, I gave a lot of my, my, my reasons for why I've come to, in a way, kind of dislike about Pyromania, but the things that I still like. So I'm going to get off my personal soapbox now and I'm just going to, just end this with, if you liked Pyromania, what are the reasons why you like this album? And again, if you're going to comment on why, you know, your reasons or what you liked about this album, you can leave those uh, comments in the comment section below. But if you want to comment on why you disliked and you hated Pyromania, then you as well can leave those comments in the comment section below. But if you're one of those that never listened to Power Mania, well, you know what? You don't need me to tell you where, where to begin, okay? You don't need to. I don't need to, to uh, point you in any direction, okay? I'm just going to leave it up to you what period you're going to start with because it's all in your court, okay? The ball is in your court. It's not in my court. So. so there it is, folks. There's my somewhat discussion of Pyromania in the wake of its 40th anniversary. Hope all of you enjoyed, or maybe you did not enjoy this one, but you know what? I don't give a shit. So there it is. That's it. This is Harry Thrasher saying I am out, and I'll see you all later. Take care, everyone.